Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Trogly's Guitar Show. Yes! I've finally gotten my hands on a Gibson Futura, also known as the Gibson Corvus, but a little bit more on that later. This is a model that not everybody knows about, but for Gibson enthusiasts like me, these things are sweet. They've got a funky body design, they've got a funky headstock design, but let's go ahead and learn the history of this model. First off, the name, Futura. Gibson really likes this name because they've used it on multiple occasions. The first existence of a guitar called a Futura was basically the Explorer prototype in the 50s. Now, granted, that name was given to it after the fact. Gibson did not give that model that name. It's collectors and people like us. And then in 2014, there was a Les Paul and SG Futura, which I have done a review on both. One of them smelled terribly like marijuana, and the other one had a crazily flamed neck. But those are a P90 neck and a humbucker bridge combination guitar. And then there's this one from the 80s. But to fully understand why the Futuras sell for as much as they do, as well as why these are special, we need to learn about the base model, the Corvus. The Corvus and Futura models were introduced in 1982 and only lasted two years because, well, let's face it, these things didn't sell well, eh, for obvious reasons. These were a budget line of guitars that were introduced alongside the Invader and Challenger. Now those two models, personally, they, they don't do anything for me. I've never pined after owning one, but the Corvus has always had a special place in my heart because it's, it's just such an ugly duckling. <laughs> the Corvus model had three different lineups. There was the Corvus 1, Corvus 2, as well as the Corvus 3. The Corvus 1 has a single bridge humbucker and a master volume and master tone. The Corvus 2 is basically the same thing except for you now have two humbuckers and a three-way toggle switch. The Corvus 3 is where things get interesting though. You get three single coiled pickups with a five-way blade switch. So essentially that's two very different sounding guitars because well, one just has one more humbucker than the other. But what all of those models had in common is they had Corvus on the truss rod cover, a single ply black pick guard, an intonatable wrap tail piece, chrome hardware, a bolt on maple neck with a rosewood fretboard and with an alder body. Their output jacks were also located on the front side of the guitar. So now let's talk about this beautiful model. This is the upgraded version. This is the highest end Corvus. It's so high end, they changed the name to Futura. But these are special because they have a two pneumatic bridge and tailpiece, so you don't just have the wrap tail. They have gold hardware, the output jack is not on the front. I love this. It is on the side. The pick guard itself, instead of being single ply black, is actually five ply in a black and white pattern, so it makes it look even more high end there. Your body has been upgraded to maple, and you get an ebony fretboard. And the biggest thing for these, this isn't just a set neck. This is neck through construction and that is huge for on a Gibson guitar. And personally for me, that's why I've always wanted a Futura because you know, bolt on necks for Gibson usually means it's of cheaper quality. It doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, I love the S1 and like the Marauder series and they're bolt ons, but I've always wanted one of these Futuras. But why this freaky design? This guitar was designed by a guy named Chuck Burge. He was part of Gibson's research and development. Essentially, what he was doing here is headless guitars were very popular. So he decided that he would do this interesting V shape here in order to install tuners down here to have the first headless Gibson. Bruce Bolin, the head of research and development, approved the design and they built a prototype of this guitar that was headless. 
Now keep in mind, research and development was still in Kalamazoo at this point in time. So when they sent that prototype down to the marketing team, it was like, hey, you wanna help us market this guitar? We'll make it really successful and popular. They saw the headless design and said, no, it needs a head. So they made them put this headstock on it. Now you can call this headstock what you will. Mr. Bolin liked to call it the Limp Richard headstock to put it nicely. The research and development team hated the end result because now you're just left with this funky design for no reason. And just in case you don't understand what I mean by a headless guitar, it's basically what Steinberger was doing where your guitar would look like this. There would literally not be a headstock and your tuners would be built in within the body. Can you imagine this guitar headless though? It would look something like this. Had the marketing team not completely have destroyed this design, I think the Futura and Corvus models would have a completely different place in history. But let's talk about the name Corvus real quick. That's actually Latin for crow. Basically what this design is supposed to look like is you've got your bird mouth right here, tweet tweet, and then you've got the feathers right here. It's basically flying like this. Whoosh, whoosh. So there was a method behind their madness here. And personally, I think Corvus sounds cool. The Futuras clearly are the most collectible out of all of them because, well, they have more desirable traits. But I would also say these are the easiest ones to collect. There might not be as many of them out there. However, there are only three finishes available. You have Ebony, Ultraviolet, which is kind of a purple color, and Pearl White. This is one of those Pearl White ones. Uh, it just looks like an aged white, but if you get up really close, you can see a very faint sparkle. You can see this mint condition pearl white custom I used to have here. But, I mean, if you take this pick guard off, you can see clear as day that this used to be a lot brighter in color and not yellow. Something else you can see that's interesting when you have the pick guard off is this is a huge swimming pool route. So if you wanted to throw a new pick guard on here and do like triple humbuckers, you could. Or if you want to get really crazy, like five single coils. But the Corvus models were offered in so many different finishes. The base color for all of them was silver. Any other color was about $50 more. And that went up increasingly, as you can see here on this chart. So altogether, there's seven different finishes on the Corvus one through three. That is silver, antique natural, ebony, orange, red, electric blue, and then I'm not sure what YM stands for. I couldn't really find a finish to match up with that. So from a collector's standpoint, I think it would be relatively easy to find three Gibson Futuras, but locating seven of each of the three base Corvus models in every single color, oh, I would love to see that collection. So now that we know a little bit more about the history of these things, Let's talk about something even way more important. What do these things sound like? This is another one from that collection up in Michigan. It was the one guitar, I saw it, I asked him how much, and I was like, okay, I'll take it because I've wanted a Futura for so long. When I plugged it in just to make sure it worked, my very first words were, wow. I was impressed by these pickups. They're very full and kind of dark sounding. They're almost jazz-like. It was definitely a very surprising sound. I was in love from that first strum. Now, when I got it home to my own setup and I could do my own harsh leads and whatnot, in my opinion, even though this is a high output bridge pickup, I felt like it could just use a little bit more bite to it. I can see why somebody would replace the bridge pickup in this. But the neck pickup I thought was nice, creamy, smooth. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. Now these have the Tim Shaw markings on the back, but from the sources online and just judging by how they sound, they have to be a Bill Lawrence design. They've been sealed with the Tarback epoxy coating. So that's usually a Lawrence design type thing. So it sounds pretty good, but how does it feel, this body shape? 
Sitting. I absolutely love this guitar. It weighs about seven pounds. It kind of reminds me of a flying V, except for it'll actually sit on your leg nicely. And it's really comfortable to play while you're sitting. I enjoyed this guitar. So I was really pumped to strap this thing up and just wail on it because I was having a great time. But I found when I put it on a strap and played it like I would in a live situation, I hate this guitar. It is so uncomfortable. <laughs> so let me explain myself here. You've got the posi lock strap buttons. You've got one right here and you've got one right here. Now, I'm not sure if you could move these to better balance this guitar, but it is incredibly neck heavy. I'm talking as soon as you let go of that neck, it does this. It wants to rest horizontally, which is not a very good way to play. So I found myself constantly having to have that extra weight on my fretting hand, which made it a little bit hard to play. And also in doing that, all of the weight on this guitar would rest right here. And despite this thing only being seven pounds, it felt like a 14 pound monster and it was hurting my shoulder. So I hate to say it, but these are not good guitars to play live. They are awesome when you're sitting, but as far as standing with this thing, there's a reason why the guy in the advertisement is standing like this. It's because that's the only way to do it, I found. So if you play it like you're doing a super solo and you rest it against your body like this, or your leg in this case, then your strap does the work for you and you can actually just focus on shredding this thing. It's awesome for that. You can get some really fast picking speed, but unless you wanna be doing this all night long for playing, eh, you'll just look kind of goofy. So I was a little bit disappointed to find out that this semi-dream guitar, uh, it's kind of a bust if you're playing standing up, but it's just a freaky guitar. I still like these things. I wouldn't mind documenting the other colors and I definitely need to get my hands on a Corvus now, preferably one of the Corvus 3 models because I feel like I already know what the humbuckers will sound like. It's time to see what those single coils are like. So now that we know a little bit more about this guitar, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. <laughs>
Now that we know how this guitar sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. Out of all the Futuras I've seen, I would rate this one as pretty darn good, but it's not necessarily what I would consider a collector's grade example. But there are very limited Futuras out there, so maybe collectors aren't as picky on these. The headstock, you've got some scratches here on the face just from string changes, but nothing too bad. The truss rods, I do have to tell you, the threads are like a little bit above the nut. It's not necessarily in I need to be reset mode, but it's good to know that, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, you might have to worry about that. But as of right now, truss rod still functions just fine. You've got your original nut on here. Very minimal fret wear. I mean, you've got a little bit, but nothing that needs addressed right away. Beautiful ebony fretboard was just cleaned and oiled. So you're good to go on this one. I would suggest a professional setup. Not because this thing plays bad. It's just because the bridge is all the way up in the air. And that's way better than being too close to the body that you can't adjust it downwards. But you've got some decent action here with tons of room to go down. You have your original pickups in here. You can see the one has the date stamp. The other one that's hotter has the sticker. To me, this looks like there were different pickups in here at one point in time and somebody had to rewire everything in there because the solder joints, they don't look original. However, the pots are era correct. You've got the correct pickups. So I think this has been restored back to originality. The output jack. If you want to play this professionally on stage, you're going to need to replace this thing. This is one of those long barrel output jacks, and they're kind of a pain in the butt to fix. Basically, your lead will become loose and sometimes just lightly fall out, and that causes a drop in connection. So, I mean, if you're just playing this at home, it's good enough. You don't have to do anything. But if you plan to take this on stage, definitely know you're going to have to replace that. Have your original bridge and tailpiece here and the condition here uh it's it's an okay shape you can see you've got a scratch right there there's quite a few small dings that break the finish like there's the first one right here for being a pearl white example though it does not have a lot of finish checking i mean obviously there is some like in this area right there but usually these semi-metallic finishes they'll be all over the guitar especially the alder bodied corpuses. But you can see you've got some light nicks and dings on the top. Most of the front of the body is covered by this pick guard, so you don't see too much of the wear, but you've definitely got nicks and dings. It's not a mint condition collectible. You don't have to be scared to play it either. Back of the headstock, our serial number is 81783530. You can see you've got a ding at the top of the headstock here, as well as some light edge wear in general, because let's face it, these things are kind of like explorers. You're going to ding them against things. On the face of the headstock here, you can see there's a little bit of finish missing. I don't think I pointed that out earlier. And that was likely caused by a stand, because here you can see the stand rash on both sides. It's kind of more golden in color. There is a very small finish check line right there. It's not a brake, crack, or repair, though. The neck does have a few lines of, like, smudging and whatnot. I tried to clean those off the best I could, but they're still kind of there. And it looks like you've got some more stand rash right here. But this neck, very chunky. I would pretty much consider this one a 50s neck. I mean, it's not overly thick baseball bat, but, but it kind of reminds me of an L6S, except for it has a traditional nut width. It kind of starts off nice and rounded, but it gets super fat up here for your solos. You have your neck through construction. This is something else I didn't really touch upon earlier, is I was always curious if these things play exceptionally well. Um, this neck joint, it doesn't necessarily help you get to the upper frets. I mean, you can comfortably get all the way up to the 21st fret, but that 22nd one, this part is still a little bit in your way. So I kind of wish, since it is a neck through construction, that they just would have sanded this away a little bit more, because then I think this model would be even cooler. But back of the body, once again, some stand rash right there, but not a lot of buckle worming or rash. I was very impressed to see that. 
I mean, you've got a few light scratches here and there, but not a lot. Mainly just some light black scuffing here or there that might be able to be polished out. Essentially, the worst thing about the condition of this guitar are these finished dings along the edges. And you can see you've got another considerable one right there. There's a small one right here. You've got some clear coat wear there. But hey, at least you still have your original Posilock strap buttons and whatnot. So it's got some wear, but it's still very presentable. Let's take a look under black light. Essentially all we'll see under black light here are those small little finish chips I was talking about earlier, as well as the stand rash marks. But you can see you've got your original black speed knobs on here and nothing too major to go over on the front. Back of the instrument, once again, stand rash, and you've got those light finish chips along the edge. This is just a, a beautifully glowing example here. So besides some finished chips along the edges, you're pretty good on the body. The neck, again, you've got some light stand rash here and there, as well as on the sides of the neck, but it is brake, crack, and repair free. And honestly, it black lights really well. And if you're wondering how it will sit on a stand, it actually sits just like a regular guitar, believe it or not. It's got to sit a little bit lopsided, but it will mount just fine. Thankfully, this one does retain its original Gibson hard shell case. Eh, these won't properly fit in much else. So you've got some scuffs from it being in a collection, but overall, I would rate this case as pretty good condition. You've got some light tears to the Tolex right here. But other than that, all your latches are present and functioning. Nothing's like coming apart or anything. The interior is a nice blue color, and here you can see what the original case looks like. So a Les Paul won't fit in here because, well, you've got all this extra padding. I mean, you could probably compress it if you wanted to. For the curious minds, yes, a Les Paul can fit in here. That will just compress down. But the only thing that keeps it from closing is a very plush padding up here. So if you really smash that down, if you ever find a Corvus case, yes, it will fit your Les Paul. But the interior is in good shape. You can see the padding comes back. You can see the lining is a little bit unglued from itself, but well, that's a pretty easy fix. I just pressed it back down. You also have the owner's manual in here, which kind of tells you about some of the things Gibson was doing back then. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson Corvus Futura, feel free to check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale ad. Thank you Troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.